Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pastor Will. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. I want to encourage you if uh, uh, you have access to uh, the notes that uh, either ebczenia.org or were uh, sent out to you via email by Barb. You'll want to take your notes out and be ready this morning as we gather together. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, if you're there sitting in your care groups uh, or you're at home on your own, um, it would be really advantageous for you to get a hold of those notes and so you can follow through. And certainly if you're in a care group, uh, it'll help your discussions a little bit later uh, to have a little bit more uh, substance to them as you can recall what we're going to talk about today. Well, as we come uh, here, Will referred to in his prayer, uh, Jesus is our good shepherd, uh, the one who guides us, the one who saves us, the one who not only leads us through life, but leads us through the darkest uh, uh, times of life and even through death on the other side to the life that he's promised us uh, because of his resurrection. But when Jesus was here on the earth, he said in John chapter 10, the thing that, that you know about the sheep uh, that are Jesus' sheep is that they hear his voice and they recognize his voice and they follow him. Well, since the time that Jesus has been here, he left his voice, he left his voice in scripture. And so he appointed the apostles uh, to write down the words that we would need until he returned. And so he left a commission, and many of you know this in Matthew 28. He said to the disciples, I've given you everything that you need to know uh, until the end of the age. And now I want you to take what I have taught you, and I want you to go and make disciples and teach them everything that I've taught you and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I am with you even unto the end of the age. And so the, the shepherd's voice is what we need, and especially in this moment where we are, where it just seems like we're in a moment of chaos in our country. And uh, on top of the COVID, uh, we've got all kinds of racial stress and violence that's happening in America. And so in this moment, for many people, it just seems like the wheels have fallen off. And it's a crisis. And uh, many of you, I, I've talked with some of you that uh, you just can't listen to the news anymore. You can't tune in anymore. It's just overwhelming. It's depressing or it's difficult. Uh, but for some of you, the way you're trying to manage the crisis is by staying completely enmeshed in it. And in the process of that, uh, one of the things that often happens to us in a crisis is we forget the fundamentals. We forget the baseline things that we desperately need, especially in a time of crisis. And if there's ever a time where the people of God needed to hear in America the shepherd's voice, today is a day. And so we're going to pull away from the contemporary events. We're going to return to our series on doctrine, and we're going to continue talking about the Scriptures themselves and what the Scriptures say about themselves. What are they? And we talk first about them being inspired, being the very words of God, and that God, through His authorized prophets in the Old Testament and His apostles in the New, gave His words to guide His people until He wraps up this age. And so we have, as we are people, as Paul would say, who stand on the end of the ages. We have the full word of God. As the apostles died, the canon closed. And as Steve, Pastor Steve talked, us, uh, talked with us about that, why these 66 books? Why do we have these as our rule, as our canon, as our guide, as our authority? Uh, because these books have the marks of inspired documents. They were written by authorized agents. Right? They agree on their common rule of faith. And the church over the ages has borne witness to their inspired character. And so this is the voice of God for his people until Christ returns. And so in this moment, when there's a crisis of all times, we need to go back and listen to the shepherd's voice. And so we want to talk about, we're going to pull away from the contemporary crisis, talk about some of the resources that we need in times of crisis and we need the very words of God that he gave to us through his authorized representatives, and he gathered together as a collection to give us the full counsel, his full counsel for us, until Christ returns and writes all things. So today, as we talk about the doctrine of Scripture, I want to talk a little bit about translations and uh, about why we have all the translations and about which one should I use. Uh, I mentioned uh, in, in different settings that one of the cruelest things you might do to a new Christian 
is just to tell them to go get a Bible because you've got to have a Bible. If you're a Christian, you need a Bible. Often uh, that's uh, 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 short-circuited by somebody just saying, here, take this Bible. And so we hand out a Bible as we often do at Emmanuel. But if you just t- told someone to go get a Bible today and you sent them out to Amazon to get one, it would be an absolutely bewildering a set of options, right? Uh, an alphabet soup of translations, right? NIVs, uh, CI, uh, CSBs, HCSB, um, uh, NASB, TNIV, on and on and on it goes. And you're thinking, well, I don't know which one of those to get. And then on top of that, you've got all kinds of study Bibles. You've got men's Bibles, women's Bibles, children's Bibles, teens' Bibles, right? Environmentalist friendly Bibles. It, it just goes on and on and on, right? Well, how do, we, how do we navigate through that? What does it say about the Word of God itself in terms of that? But why all the translations and which one should I use? Now, when we look at the, the issue of translations, what we recognize, and most of you know that are listening to me here, the Bible was not written in English, right, or any other of the modern languages that we have apart from Hebrew. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And so there's a little bit of Aramaic thrown in there in different books like Daniel. And then by the 3rd century B.C., as you can see on the screen, uh, it had been translated, the Hebrew Old Testament had been translated into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. Uh, LXX, the Roman numeral, stand for 70 because 70 Jewish scholars translated it uh, into Greek. And it was important for the Jews at that time because most of the Jews now, after the exile, could not speak Hebrew and they couldn't read their own scriptures. So now they could read it in the language, actually, of their conquerors, right? Alexander the Great had bequeathed Greek to the world, and so now that was the lingua franca of the world, and so to be able to translate the Septuagint into Greek was actually to bring the Bible into the language that now people could read. So, and that Bible becomes the Bible of the early church because as, the, as Jesus comes and the church begins to grow, uh, it's a Greek-speaking world. Uh, most of the people can't speak Hebrew, uh, and so the Bible and the New Testament, of course, is going to be written in Greek, and the early church can meet in their house home studies and study their Bibles because they were, had a Greek copy of the Hebrew Old Testament. So we have the coming of Jesus, and then we have the Greek New Testament written, the 27 books that constitute the Greek New Testament. But then by the 4th century, Latin had become the predominant language of the church, especially in the West. And so Jerome comes along and translates the Bible into Latin, And from the 4th century, really up until the time of the Reformation, Latin was the language of the Bible. Then comes the 15th century where you have the printing press and then the Reformation. And one of the emphases of the Reformation was to put the Bible in the language of the various people groups. Because at that point in time at the Reformation, you would go to church, you couldn't read your own Bible because most people couldn't speak Latin. So you would be trained as a priest or a pastor in Latin so that you could read the Bible, and then you would expose it for people. But nobody had copies in their own home. You couldn't afford them. Well, now the printing press comes along. It's affordable to get a copy, and people want to read their scriptures, and there's an emphasis in the Reformation on the importance of every Christian reading the scriptures and being responsible before God for them. And so then we get translations in German, English, and so forth and so on to provide for that. And now here where we stand today, it just seems like uh, Katie bar the door. There are as many translations as you can imagine. There's dozens of them, right? You even have ones that exist on the internet uh, that we can get access to, and you can go to many websites and see uh, literally dozens of translations that you can read through uh, in English, let alone all the other translations in other languages. Now, the key questions, though, we want to look at today is we want to say, to why do translations differ? Why are they different from each other? And we're going to talk, too, about good translations as opposed to bad ones. And why do we keep making new translations? Why can't we just stop? Why don't we just stop and not make any more new translations? Why can't we just quit in terms of that? Don't we have enough? And then the question is, which one should I use and which one should we use at Emmanuel? If you come to Emmanuel, many different translations are represented here. There's a new new, new, translation. a living translation that uh, Pastor Will loves to pass out and give. There's the ESV, the English Standard Version that many people use. There's the NIV, uh, which is the one that I have used for a long time. I know there's some that have the New American Standard Bible and some that have the Christian Standard Bible. So we want to talk a little bit about that and talk about what that says about the Scriptures and to kind of guide us in that. 
And one of the things I want to emphasize, and we're going to say this at the beginning and the end, um, there are many good translations. The key thing is you need to get one, stick with it, and read your Bible. It's uh, one of the ironies of the moment is to have an embarrassment of riches, which actually discourages us from actually engaging the Scriptures. So we're going to come there in a moment. Now, here's three key issues that explain these questions. Why do we have so many translations? Right? Why can't we stop translating them, so forth and so on? But what are the kind of key issues? And you'll see these here. And, th and three things, and we're going to come back and explain each one of those. Readability. The reasons that translations are different from each other and the reasons why there's a need for ongoing translations are, is the issue of readability. And I'll come back and explain that, uh, that it can be actually read and understood uh, by the audience that it's translated for. The second one is the translation philosophy that guides the way the translation is being done. Okay? Now, as far as we're concerned here from Scripture, the translations need to be faithful to the text itself. A translation is not trying to put in the Bible what you want it to say. It's trying to render the meaning of the Bible in a different language from what it was originally written in. So the, the, the translations we're interested in, right, within uh, Emmanuel here, within the evangelical world, are, are ones that are trying to expose or to bring out the meaning of the text in English that is there in Greek and Hebrew. We're not interested in trying to write things into the Bible to make it our Bible, we want to make sure that it's God's words expressed in English in ways that are faithful to the Greek and Hebrew. It's okay, a key idea. But there's different ways to go about doing that, different translation philosophies, and we'll be, briefly talk about that. And then finally, the original text that's used. And I want to say here that the first two are the most significant, the last one is the most insignificant. It accounts for very few differences and mostly in, in the New Testament. Uh, and they're all insignificant in the sense that they do not change any major doctrine in Scripture, uh, uh, nor do they, they adjust any major teaching. Now, so let's look at some of these here, right? Now, when I talk about readability, readability, if uh, we have a number of teachers in, in, uh, at Emmanuel who teach in, in elementary and junior high and high school, and readability is well known within education circles, and you often hear it from parents, right, when they're trying to talk about uh, how brilliant their child is, right? Their, their child is in third grade, and they're reading on a fifth grade reading level, right? Or they're in first grade, and they're reading fifth grade books, right? And all those things are talking about, well, readability. How do you, how do you actually grade a given piece of literature or a book to say that if you're in second grade, you should be reading this? And if you're in fifth grade, you should be reading this, Right? and different things along those lines. So readability has to do with the level of the sophistication of the translation itself. What audience is, is it heading toward that if that audience actually engages that translation, they can read it with understanding? Are they looking to connect with third graders, fifth graders, twelfth graders, that kind of thing? And also readability has to do with language over time changes. Right? In my lifetime, the little word G-A-Y, gay. In my lifetime, that used to mean somebody who was happy and carefree. Matter of fact, we even have uh, periods of American history called the gay 90s or the gay uh, 20s, if you were, 30s. Right? And if you look back in that, G-A-Y meant somebody who was happy or carefree. Well, and today, if you use the term gay, G-A-Y, it means something very, very different. Matter of fact, it means something so significantly different that the previous meaning of the word has been so eclipsed that if you want to express carefree or happy, you need a different word to use it for it. Right? I grew up uh, reading the King James Bible uh, as a young man, and I've shared this with you before. I remember reading Romans chapter 1, and I believe it's verse 12, and Paul was talking about how he wanted to come visit the Romans and he says, I wanted to come visit you, but I've been let hitherto. And I remember reading that as a young man, and I was saying, he's been let hitherto. He wanted to come, but he's been let hitherto. And he's, he's talking like he couldn't get there. And I said, but to let somebody do something is to permit them to do something. I thought that was for sure. And then, of course, I didn't have hitherto in my vocabulary. I had to go look that up, too. But even the word let didn't make sense. Well, it wasn't readable for me because language had changed. 
right? As a matter of fact, any of you that are old King James readers, you know that if you drop back into the verses you memorized, when you say those King James verses, you're very uh, aware of the fact that it doesn't sound like the English you speak today. The grammar, the sentences, they're just different. So readability not only has to do with um, uh, the, what level of, of access you can get, whether it's a first grade, third grade, fifth grade level, it also has to do whether or not the language is actually readable and it actually means what you want it to say given the changes in language. Right? Now let me give you some examples here of readability with regards to grade level. Okay? Some of you might find this interesting. So a little quiz here. Okay? Now here... Our first example is the New American Standard Bible. This came along really from the West Coast first. It was a very a literal translation, we'll find it. And so as you read it, the New American Standard was translated and targeting a particular audience. Well, here is just Romans 12, 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Well, if we had teachers here, they would grade that as an 11th grade level book. So it's written toward people who have 11th grade capabilities of vocabulary, grammar, and understanding. Okay, so New American Standard. Let me give another one. Here's the international children's version, right? Think about this one. Live together in peace with each other. Don't be proud, but make friends with those who are unimportant. Do not think how smart you are. There you go. No haughty in this one. Right? Well, what are they heading for here? That's a third grade level translation. So they're trying to break down those ideas in small little sentences with very simple vocabulary. Let me give you another one. Here's the King James Version. Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Okay? Many people aren't aware King James is written on a 12th grade level. So it was looking at people who are seniors in high school that the kind of vocabulary and grammar and the length of sentences are, are headed toward somebody of that level. Let me give you another one. The New King James Version, right? Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Notice how the vocabulary changes because we don't use wise in your own conceits anymore, right? So here, though, it's heading toward a ninth grade level. Okay. I'll give you a couple more. The NIV, well, where's that shooting, right? The one that I have read for years. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Well, where's that hitting? Seventh grade, seventh grade level, just shy of where my wife is in her eighth grade class. Okay. Now, let me give you the message, right? This is a free translation. And we'll think about this one. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Right? So that is, and what we're going to find in this next slide is it's written at like a second and third grade level in terms of the educational level that it assumes on behalf of the people who read it. Now, what I just want to illustrate is one of the reasons that translations differ is they're after the same meaning, but they're trying to hit a different audience. And also, they're trying to update the expressions to make sure that it communicates to us what the Scriptures are actually saying. Now, here you'll see on this slide, uh, which you can refer to later on, but this is uh, a person who's put together uh, most of the translations that are used within evangelical circles, and he's graded them along the scale, right? Moving from the third grade level up to the 12th grade level. And so you'll find here, there's the NIV right there in the middle, the 7th and 8th grade. There's the New Living Translation, 6th grade here. And then the Message, 4th and 5th grade. And then down on the end, the NIRV, New International Revised Version, is down on a 3rd grade level. Right? So those are the different translations. So one of the reasons that they differ is not because they're after different meanings, is that they're after different audiences to get access to the text, okay? So that determines it. I think what it is now, it used to be that our, 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 our um, newspapers, when they were written, were written at a kind of an eighth grade level. That's dropped now down to a fifth grade level, and that is to say the ones that are left, right, in terms of their being published, right? So things have shifted. 
But that's one of the reasons, readability, the need to update language, and the need to make it so that people who are the target audience can read it. It's a key thing, right? So that should fit into one of the choices of why you choose one translation over another, okay? Now, the second thing is the philosophy of translation. This is my professorial moment, and I'm not going to hang here for a long time, but I just want to give you some ideas that there are people that are thinking deeply about how to translate the Bible. And of course, the goal is they want to make sure that the message of the Bible can be heard and obeyed by the people of God, okay? There are people who give their lives to that around the world. Wycliffe translators, United, uh, uh, United Bible Societies, right, are busy trying to get the Bible into people's hands. Now, so the first philosophy of translation is called literal or word for word, right? And this is where you're trying to reflect the Greek or the Hebrew as close to the way it's worded in the original. Now, this is impossible to do completely because if you word it literally the way the Greek or Hebrew would, it wouldn't make sense in English. And that's one of the problems with little translation. The translators seek to render the original language into the target language, English for us, as close as possible to the individual words and grammar of the original language, right? And these tend to be less interpretive, but they also struggle with actually being understandable. So one of the most literal translations that we have that many evangelicals use is the New American Standard Bible, but it's really bad contemporary English. It's rough. It's a hard Bible to read in public because it's hard to understand, right? So literal translations tend to be less interpretive, but they leave ambiguities for readers to interpret, okay? So literal translation uh, is that one, okay? Now, the second one, keep moving here, is called dynamic equivalence. That is where you're going to find the NIV, and you're going to find New International Version. You're going to find the English Standard Version, the ESV. But here, they're trying to give the thoughts across, and so what you may find is that they're going to have to add phrases or they're going to have to use different terms to try to get the thought across, but they're going to try to stay as close as they can to the meaning of the original. So here the translators seek to render the meanings of the original, giving priority to contemporary grammar. So here they're going to get the meaning across, the meanings of the words across, and the meanings of the words in combination with each other, but they're going to put it in English that we recognize, okay? that we recognize, and it's closer to the way we speak today. So uh, things have changed in the way we use English, right? Every day, uh, words are being added to the dictionary that weren't there before, and words that were used to mean certain things are being changed dramatically. And just to be very contemporary in that application right now, the, the definition of the word racism is morphing dramatically every day. It used to be somebody who behaved in a way that demonstrated that they viewed another race was less than them, uh, then it became uh, something that you could only do if you were in a position of power, and if you were a powerless person, you can't be racist, right? Uh, and then, on the other hand, now it becomes something that's endemic to a particular person's color, right? Whatever the case may be, that word is just slippery as all get out in terms of that. Well, that happens over time, and you change it. So translators seek to render the meanings of the original, giving priority contemporary grammar, vocabulary, and style. And they tend to be moderately interpretive because they're trying to bring it across in English that is contemporary, but they leave fewer ambiguities, right? So when you see the NIV and the ESV, they are easier to read and understand than the New American Standard Bible. When you come to the NLT, the New Living Translation, it's even easier yet because it moves a little bit further on this scale toward a free translation. Now, the last one, then, is the free, and this is really a paraphrase. And that last one I read to you, the message, is a paraphrase. The translators reader, uh, render the original text in the colloquial expression of the target language. A great deal of freedom to render the original idiomatically, right, in the target language with little concern for the form of the original, right? So, uh, as we read with that message one, don't be a big somebody, right? Although that word for somebody is not there in Greek, it's not there in the text, but he's trying to render the idea of what Paul is saying in a contemporary idiom 
that everyone would recognize. Okay? So these, the message, Philip's translation, the Living Bible, actually the Philip's translation, the Living Bible, one thing that happens with a free translation is they're so tied to their moment because they use contemporary expressions, they get dated real quickly. If you go read the Living Bible today, it sounds like a slice of the 1970s. And pretty soon, the message will sound like a slice of the 1990s as things move on. Now, so there are no clear-cut categories on this continuum of this dynamic equivalent, uh, free and literal translation. Every translation will have a blend of these, but they will lend one direction or the other. As a matter of fact, I'll just give you a, a, an example here, right? This is that famous phrase in Romans chapter 6 where Paul says, should we sin in order that grace may abound? And what does he say after that? Well, God forbid. No, we shouldn't do that. Well, here's a comparison of some of those major translations. The Greek phrase is meganoito. And the New American Standard right there at the beginning is the most literal. May it never be. May it never be is a very literal rendering, meaning trying to keep very close to the actual meaning of the words and not add any explicatory words to try to bring out the force. Well, there's the King James, God forbid. That's actually surprisingly, even though the King James is often very literal, in this one, it's a free translation because meganoito does not include the word God at all, nor does it include the word forbid. It just says, may it never be. But an idiomatic expression is, God forbid, may God make that never happen, right? So it's a free translation. And then the NIV, in this case, is very close to the literal translation by no means, but again, that is a kind of a contemporary idiom to express, no, by no means, let, that, that's impossible. We don't want that to happen, right? The Living Bible, certainly not. And then you get to Phillips, right, which is an English Bible, and it sounds pretty English, doesn't it? What a ghastly thought, right? So the word ghastly is not there in the Greek. Thought is not there in the Greek, right? But he's trying to use an idiom that gets at the idea that, no, 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 don't even consider that. Don't even consider that. May that never be, right? Now, all of them are trying to get at the meaning, but the philosophy of translation changes the way they render it. It changes the way they render it. Now, so this is why, I, uh, just a brief chart here to show you that there's this kind of a sliding scale. If you look, uh, I think, as you're looking on the screen over to your left is the literal, word for word, trying to be very close to the text in a woodenly literal way. Clear on the right hand is the free or the paraphrase, and right in the middle is the dynamic equivalent. And as you look there, you can see right there in the middle, you can see the NIV, uh, the New, Amer New International Version. You can see over to the left toward the more literal is the ESV, uh, the English Standard Version. And so this is a, kind of a standard chart that kind of orients them based on their philosophy of translation. Okay? So readability, number one, philosophy of translation, number two. And then third, the original text that they appeal to. Now, this only really makes a distinction between the King James, New King James, and the rest of the Bibles. Right? There's a small difference between the Greek uh, uh, text that's used behind the King James and New King James than that which is used behind the majority of all the other Bibles. Right? And the Wycliffe translators today, as they translate the scriptures around the world, they use the text behind the NIV and the ESV and all the major translations the King James Version and the New King James Version appeal to a, a branch of the Greek New Testament uh, that is viewed by most evangelical scholars and almost all of them to be a secondary text that may add some things to the text. And so the best text you'll find behind the New American Standard, the NIV, and most of the standard ones. Now, even to say that, the variances are very minor and they do not affect any major teaching. So you can see here just a simple one here in Colossians 1.13. And under the Greek text behind, the New American Standard, the New International Version, the English Standard Version says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Behind the King James, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So that phrase, through his blood, is in a different copy of the early New Testament that most view as something that's later than the original, okay? Now, that's a very minor thing, and I just want to suggest to you that all the differences between the King James 
and uh, other translations and translations between each other has less to do with any kind of text underlying than it has to do with readability issues and um, translation philosophy. Now, so here, just let me give you some concluding observations as we look through this. Okay? One, we need to praise God for preserving His Word and be confident that we have the words of God. Okay? It's very clear that God designed, when He gave the Word in Greek and Hebrew over His providence, that He gave it, and that language has the ability, has the stability to be able to take a meaning expressed in Greek and Hebrew and represent it in other languages. But the goal, of course, is to take that meaning and present it accurately. And so thinking carefully about how to take what God said to his original listeners in Hebrew or in Greek and translate it into English and Spanish and uh, African dialects and, and uh, European dialects, that is what God uh, has enabled that to do. And today, we have his words, and we need not worry about them. Okay, two, translations are inspired to the degree that they reflect the meaning of the original text. That's why, it, to say this, every translation is only as good as it accurately reflects what the Greek and Hebrew say. This is why it's appropriate to have scholars who love Jesus and who know the Scriptures and know the Bible to evaluate translations when they come out. It's not the translation that's inspired, it's the text that's being translated that's inspired, and the translation is only as good as it reflects the meaning of the original. And there are some translations that we would not recommend at all because they're not trying to translate, they're trying to write their own. Okay? So that's why you'll find discussions among Bible-believing scholars about whether this is a good translation, or they may disagree with a given passage because they don't think it accurately represents the original text. Okay? That's not a problem in the Word of God, that's a problem in the translation of it. Okay? Then the third thing, the ongoing need for new translations, for clarity and for our mission, right? We need to update the Scriptures to make sure that they're still saying what they, uh, uh, what they mean as language changes. Right? And for our mission, we need to keep translating the Scriptures into other language groups so that people can have the Word of God in their language. So, and the fact that translation involves interpretation means that the church needs to train people to be fluent in the original languages. That's why we have, where I, I teach, uh, I teach young men and women to be able to read uh, Koine Greek, which is the Greek of the New Testament, because we need them to be experts for the behalf of their body so that as new translations come on the, on the fore, come up on the scene, that they can stand in the gap and help the people of God to say, is this a good translation or not? Right? And they've got the ability to do that. Fourth thing, different translations of the New Testament have more to do with the audience they are for and the philosophy of translation used than the slight differences in the Greek text behind them. Translations differ because they are done with different purposes in mind. Right? We in America are just so privileged that uh, as parents, we have people who have labored to break down the concepts of the Bible so that our children can understand them. Right? So many languages do not have that, but their purpose is we want this to be read by third graders, or we want this to be read by somebody who's fourth and fifth grade, or we want to make sure that this is read by people who are eighth graders, whatever the case may be, their purposes are guiding uh, the level of the difficulty. And that's within. And then of the translation used by evangelicals, by those who believe in Christ and believe the inspired scriptures, right? The NIV, New International Version, the Inter English Standard Version, ESV, Christian Standard Bible, CSB, New King James, KJV, all get the essential truths across, right? So whatever Bible that you use, you can get across, you can get what God wants for you to give, get from Him. Okay. Now, just to conclude, a couple guidelines. So what do you need to do? What do we need to do as the people of God? We need to choose one, right? If you're a translation grazer, you need to choose one, right? One of the downsides of having translations as we've had in the West is people have stopped memorizing their scriptures, and they're, they're fluent in moving around in kind of a fluid way between translations, and they never wrestle with the text as meditating on it and memorizing it, right? You need to choose one and for your study and memorization. So I recommend any of these 
uh, that are here. The one I haven't mentioned here is called the New English Translation. Uh, that one comes out of Dallas Theological Seminary. That's available online at Bible.org, and you'll see that in your notes. Okay? Number two, use a more literal translation for detailed Bible study. And what I mean by that is you want one that you can engage the text. It's going to be a little bit more work for you to read it, but when you study it, it lets you encounter the text with less interpretation by the translators. Okay? So as you get uh, 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 studying your Bible, you may want to have one, New American Standard, the NIV, English Standard Version, the Net Bible, or the New English Translation. Those are all good ones to have as a study Bible. And then thirdly, compare translations in your Bible study. One of the ways for you to be aware of the kind of meaning possibilities of a given text is to pay attention to the different ways it's translated. This will help you to understand by helping you have a commentary and an understanding from other translations that will also uh, pique your interest and give you uh, some, uh, some uh, uh, in invitation to dig in. Right? And there's some great websites that you can do this on. You can do this on BibleGateway.com. Uh, you can do this on Bible.org. You can do it on BlueLetterBible.org. You'll see these in your notes. These are all great, handy tools. And then fourthly, when you've understood the text, then you can turn to one of the free translations like the message, and then you read the message and you say, that gets it. That really expresses it well. But you can use the message because you're confident that it's really representing what the text says. So I wouldn't make the message as my go-to translation, but I would have it there and I have used it myself to illustrate the meaning of the text. Now I'm going to ask Sarah to come and, and uh, lead us in our final song, and then I want to conclude here in a couple minutes with some uh, guidance for you to kind of reflect over what we've learned about the Scriptures uh, as we have them now in our English translations. So Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. I asked Sarah to, to sing that song for us. That's a throwback to uh, the old days of my youth of thinking about the Scriptures as the words of God that bring us life. Um, as you gather in your groups today, and I want to encourage you to do that, and even if you're by yourself and you pull out the notes, I've just given you some questions to kind of talk over uh, with one another. And the first thing I want you to do is just take a poll in your group about which translations are represented. And also at the same time, you're going to find out, does each person have a Bible? And if you don't have, if everybody doesn't, if there's not a Bible that represented by every person who's there, then you want to take uh, it upon yourself as a group to make sure that everyone has a copy of the Scriptures. So talk about what you use, use and encourage everyone to choose one and stick with it. And then second, talk about how you engage your Bibles. What do you do when you study them? And then I've, lastly, I've given you just a kind of a, a little exercise to take a particular passage and use some translations and compare them to each other and see how that raises questions about the meaning of the text itself. I'm giving you Philippians 2, 5, and 6, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later on. So you can, if you don't have multiple translations represented by the people in your group, right, uh, you'll, you can just go right on your phone and go to BibleGateway.com, and you can pull up 300 translations. So you won't have a hard time comparing and contrasting, but I want you to engage around the Word of God, and I just want to end by reminding you, I don't care what's going on in the world, and especially when things are going on difficult and, are, and in chaos. We need to be the people of God who turn to hear the voice of the shepherd. We need to be reminded of who he is, whose we are, what really matters. We need to be people who hear his voice and follow him. And so let's become people of his word because we want to follow the shepherd's voice. So let's pray together as we conclude today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for all that we have in Christ today. Lord, we uh, marvel at your purposes, Lord, uh, uh, that you have, have uh, left. And in this time, which is your time of patience, Lord, you, you are holding back the return of Christ because you are uh, willing that, that many would come to repentance. And Lord, in your purposes, this is a time of your patience. And in the in-between time, you left us with our marching orders. You left us with the letter that tells us how you think about us and how you love us. You left us, uh, Lord, with guidance for how to love each other. Lord, and, and I pray that you would help us as your people 
to be people who listen to the voice of the shepherd. Lord, may uh, our time in your word uh, be as careful and as serious and as intense as it is before the news media, as it is before our social media. Lord, please, Lord, help us not to be so wrapped up in the moment that we're unarmed. We, we don't have any perspective and wisdom to engage our moment because we have not been listening to the shepherd. So Lord, bless our groups, bless our church. Lord, help us to grow in our understanding of you through your understanding, through the understanding of your word. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.